today's webinar. Uh, today's uh, CAFC's Presents episode is called uh, Moral Distress, Insight from Stories from the fr uh, Stories in the PICU. And we have today with us, we have uh, Wendy Austin and Dr. Daniel Garros from uh, the Stollery Children's Hospital in Edmonton. So today's uh, webinar, as always, is being recorded. Uh, for those of you who have been uh, on our webinars before, we do uh, record these and post them on the Knowledge Exchange Network that you can see up on the screen in front of us, along with any other resources that we might be making available. Uh, and we also uh, have a link uh, on the Knowledge Exchange Network already where you can find a lot of the information that's going to be presented today. Uh, you can find a lot of the background information associated with that at their, at their website. It's at the University of Alberta site. Uh, it's at picumoraldistress.ualberta.ca, but all that information is on the Knowledge Exchange Network. Uh, as all of you know, we do these webinars every Wednesday at 11 uh, a.m. Eastern Time, occasionally outside of that, but that's our usual time slot. Uh, and if for any information about our uh, webinars, you can always go to the CAFC website at cafc.org. Uh, you can click on the CAFC Presents link, which will provide you with a calendar of events, uh, a link to... Uh, up here to sign up for the email notifications for any upcoming webinars, uh, a link to the Knowledge Exchange Network where you can see uh, all of the recorded webinars as well. So for any of you who are going to uh, ask questions about uh, whether the presentations will be made available, I can preempt that by telling you that uh, if the presenters make the PDF of their presentation available, we will certainly post it on the, on the Knowledge Exchange Network, but the recording at least, the audio-visual recording will be made available. So, uh, oh, and here's their uh, website uh, at uh, the, the University of Alberta site. So that's, uh, again, uh, picumoraldistress.ualberta.ca for any additional research uh, associated with uh, the presentation today. So as I said, today's presentation is Moral Distress Insight from Stories in the PICU, and we have uh, Dr. Wendy Austin with us, and Dr. Austin is a professor with the Faculty of Nursing and the John Dossiter Health, e Health Ethics Centre at the University of Alberta. And she holds the Canada Research Chair in Relational Ethics in Healthcare. Uh, and we also have Dr. Daniel Garros, who's a pediatric intensivist at the Stollery Children's Hospital in Edmonton, and is also a, a, an associate clinical professor at the Department of Pediatrics and Faculty of Medicine at the University of Alberta. Uh, so before I, I uh, hand the, the, the virtual podium over to our presenters, I just want to say that as a, as a former respiratory therapist, I can certainly appreciate this uh, this topic. I uh, worked in the ICUs and the emergency rooms for quite a few years uh, in Edmonton, in fact, at, not at Stollery, but at the University of Alberta Hospital. So I can appreciate uh, experiencing moral distress in those situations. So I, I personally am looking very forward to this presentation and I know from the size of the audience that many of you are. And just another reminder that if you have questions as we're going through the presentation, uh, please type them into the question box as you think of them. Don't feel, feel that you have to wait for us to call for questions. Uh, just type them in as you think of them so that A, you don't forget them and uh, B, we, we can see at what point during the presentation these questions are coming in. Uh, so without any uh, further ado, I will hand the virtual uh, podium over to uh, Dr. Garros and Dr. Austin. Over to you. Thank you. We just want to start by thanking you for the opportunity to uh, share our research with you all this morning. Um, in our presentation, we're going to uh, try to describe our Canadian narrative study of the moral distress of uh, PICU teams. Um, and as many of you may know, the PICU's ethical issues of consent, futility, quality of life confront uh, members of multidisciplinary teams on a daily basis. And we found that the stories of PIC staff offer some insight into the moral distress that is experienced and it helps us raise questions and search for answers about how to practice ethically in healthcare environments where pushing the envelope has become the norm. Uh, we put a picture in here of us so you could see who's speaking. Not a, not a good hair day for me. Um, this is our research team, however. Daniel and I um, work with Franco Carnavelli, who is a professor of nursing at McGill University and uh, is a former director of Montreal PICU. Um, Arthur Frank is a sociology professor at the University of Calgary and he's internationally recognized as um, an expert in narrative inquiry. So we're very unfortunate to have these colleagues with us. And we want to acknowledge our research staff as well, Erica Goebel, Timothy Anderson, who is the project manager and um, also Timothy was the playwright who helped us create a play from the results of our study. And Sarah Wall and Yulia Kalevetchik 
uh, were our research assistants and again gave us enormous help. Um, this is a participatory action research project. So um, we had an advisory group. I won't name them all. I'll just leave that slide up for you to, to peruse. Um, what the advisory group in a participatory action research does is uh, it brings knowledge of the local community. So in this case, PICU communities across the country, um, as well as the disciplines that make up the PICU teams. And they gave us guidance in developing the project and the logistics of enacting it, um, as well as help us address questions we had about the analysis. And the advisory group is helping us ensure that our results are being disseminated in ways that will help uh, make an impact and help affect the change um, in the levels of moral distress that are being experienced in Canadian PICUs. We've used the um, approach of relational ethics. As Doug mentioned, I have a Canter Research Chair in this area. I just briefly want to acknowledge that how this is different from some of the other approaches to health ethics is that it situates ethical issues and the response to them in relationship. And it's acknowledged within this approach that context shapes both the understanding of a situation and also what action is the most fitting. Um, the recognition also that this environment matters allows us to consider the ways in which power and vulnerability um, influences the moral climate of an area. And also as much as we long for certainty in our moral reasoning, there's always going to be, I think, some uncertainty about how we should act. So in other words, uh, in this approach, we really acknowledge that ethics always involves some anxiety and that this will need to be with us about that. One other way that relational ethics differs from some of the more traditional approaches, uh, such as principalism, is the fact that human beings are embodied creatures for human emotion as well as um, reasoning um, and intellect is integral to their way of being. And so um, this is why we can raise questions about things like moral distress. And I've also studied compassion fatigue. Um, in some of the other approaches, these kinds of questions just don't get raised. But it's been uh, important for us to take a look at, at what happens in, as people try to be ethical healthcare professionals. Um, and we want to just ensure that everyone knows how we're defining uh, moral distress. We've used this definition by uh, a nurse colleague, Nathaniel. Um, and what I want to draw your attention to is that um, there's four main aspects to it. First of all, there is some pain or anguish that's experienced. And these can be actual physical symptoms. Persons with uh, moral distress have uh, said that they've had palpitations, nausea, diarrhea, um, they've had uh, sleep problems, they've had bouts of weeping, and these kinds of things as well. They'll find it affects not just professional relationships, but also their personal ones as well. Um, so this is a response, however, to a situation in which the person has, has become aware of a moral problem, um, and they see it for a moral problem, that something's wrong ethically here or something is happening that has a strong ethical component to it. They're acknowledging more responsibility for that. And then they're making a correct moral judgment about what action should take place. And it's their judgment. So it is quite possible for two ethical healthcare professionals to have differing opinions on this. But what will happen following this is when the action they judge to be correct doesn't happen, because of either real constraints or perceived constraints, the person feels like they're participating in some moral wrongdoing. And this truly is distressful for them. Um, there's two other terms we want to leave you with, and that is the idea of moral residue. So this is what's referring to what happens after you've had several experiences of moral distress. Um, perhaps in a particular practice area. And they seem to build on one another. Daniel and I both found that when we give talks on moral distress, people will come to speak to us afterwards and they'll tell us of something that happened as long as 30 years ago. In fact, some of our participants, while they were telling us of current issues, 
they would go back to when they first started practicing and and fill out there was a real need to tell a story about that as well so this is something that stays with you um, and and builds upon it um, this is it's also been um, described as having a crescendo effect and what this means is that uh, after various experiences of moral distress um, the next experience will perhaps be stronger than it would be if you hadn't come with that experience so that it, it gets stronger and stronger as your uh, unresolved issues of moral distress build. So um, why um, we pick pediatric ICU as a, a place to study this and not is not because I work in pediatric ICU I I, uh, that helped, but um, it's because it's been um, an issue uh, ongoing in this area. And um, why PICU uh, people, uh, personnel experience moral distress? Well, it's uh, a bit like the story of the um, Scorda's Apprentice uh, that was uh, popularized by uh, Disney uh, on the film uh, Fantasia. Uh, once you get the, the thing going, uh, it's hard to control. So PICUs uh, are uh, pediatric intensive care units are uh, dealing with very, very important issues on a daily basis. Um, life and death is uh, present every day as in an adult critical care as well. Uh, and uh, PICUs have some characteristics that uh, make uh, people there more vulnerable to uh, major uh, ethical dilemmas and uh, the confrontation with uh, technology uh, and the humanism of uh, the unit is another important aspect. So that's why I think ICU becomes a, um, a ground uh, that is very prone to uh, allow moral distress to occur. And, uh, in the, the PICU works in an environment that is high tech. Today, it's hard to see someone dying in a modern pediatric ICU without having a trial of some advanced life support apparatus, being an ECMO machine, which is extracorporeal a membrane oxygenator or extracorporeal life support um, uh, for people that are not familiar with this. A continuous dialysis machine that is hooked up to a patient very easily in the ICU or even a ventricular assistant device. Uh, we see children in the ICU every day with a mechanical heart now beating on their lap. It's outside their body, it's beating on their lap, they're looking at it, they're going around with it, not inside them any longer. Uh, many PICU teams are facing the dilemma of uh, when to uh, stop those things or even when to put a tracheostomy on a severely debilitated uh, child that needs chronic ventilation at home whose parents um, don't have any minimal condition to care for that child and uh, the resources are not there uh, to care for that. Or let go of a child on the extracorporeal life support because of a bleed in the brain. So we have it all. Does it mean that we have to use it? Uh, that's a question that we face daily. The second thing is that uh, we're dealing with a high pressure environment. Uh, where uh, PICU physicians like myself, we are conductors of an orchestra. Uh, we try to coordinate a multidisciplinary team uh, that includes other physicians within uh, our specialty, pediatrics, but also um, surgical specialists, uh, transplant specialists, pulmonologists, and you name it, and uh, nurses, respiratory therapists, social workers, dietitians, pharmacists, physical therapists, occupational therapists, chaplain, psychologists, at clergy, like I said, everyone participating on the care of this uh, same child. So this kind of setup sometimes allows um, the uh, appearance of turf wars, uh, some people call um, tribalism, uh, a conflict of opinion regarding the prognosis are frequent. Miscommunication is a huge issue, uh, you can imagine, uh, when you have so many people involved. And the third and most uh, important issue is that we're dealing with uh, uh, ethical issues on a daily basis and end of life seems to be one of the most prominent. There was a research done in the US about 10 years ago looking at all the causes for calling uh, the ethics committee into a pediatric intensive care unit and universally was related to end of life decision making. 
uh, in our paper, however, that's, this was not the only theme, and, uh, and that I'm glad for that because there are other reasons for moral distress. But uh, ethical dilemmas regarding quality of life and worth of living, attending to a fragile, ch fragile child with chronic debilitating condition, the influence of cultural and religious backgrounds in the decision-making process, uh, recognizing family needs and preferences, uh, it's all a constant uh, theme. Uh, those are constant themes in the unit. Furthermore, uh, there are paradigms that are changing. For example, so-called lethal conditions that we used to um, uh, say, uh, these are, this, this is a lethal disease, let's do nothing about it, are no longer lethal. Syndromes that are not, on, not longer uh, called syndromes anymore. We should properly call the patients by their names, not by their syndromes. But the syndromes also are changing the way we face them. And many parents say, we want my child uh, to live despite of this syndrome. And uh, we want to participate with you uh, more and more in the decision making. And, and that is something that we face every day. Um, so those are the reasons that we think that this environment in the pediatric intensive care unit, uh, it's fertile for um, moral distress. We just want to briefly tell you about the research design as well. And as I mentioned, we um, took a participatory action research approach. Um, this is a really broad category. There's many variations on participatory action. Um, but basically, the idea is that researchers, often academic researchers, collaborate with a group or a community that wants to uh, develop knowledge because they, need, they, they see an issue and they want to promote change around that issue. And that's actually what happened here. Um, Danny and I had met at an ethics conference and that, and then um, we were um, having coffee together and talking about some of these issues. Some of the unit managers would start dropping by my office. I could invite a professional day. And you could just see that the level of moral distress was quite high in the unit, and they wanted something done about it, or they wanted to at least speak about it. And so um, we, we tried to look at what might we do and thought of various approaches. So this is a genuine res response to a need for action. And um, it's really quite appropriate for, for shared environments like an ICU. Um, and so we try to enact it in this way in that we uh, pay attention to the level of collaboration. We want to value the knowledge of the people in the community, which is how the advisory group helps us so much. And again, that we make sure that we're getting to uh, all the stakeholders, the frontline staff, administrators, and so on. So that's why we particularly appreciate this opportunity today. The method we used within this is that of narrative inquiry. It came apparent to us um, that uh, I thought people weren't sharing the stories with one another, and perhaps if um, they knew what, how each other were experiencing this particular um, child and its family and the, and the treatment that was being given, um, and the care that perhaps they would be able to understand what was happening better. To get past, as Daniel mentioned, some of the turf wars and tribalisms that can occur where you, you come with your own very strong disciplinary perspective. Um, and so stories have powers to, to make some change. And so that's when we invited um, people like um, Arthur Frank onto the team. And uh, Franco Carnavelli uses this kind of approach often as well. And certainly as being a director of, these, of the PICU, a psychologist as well as a nurse, that um, we thought we were able to go ahead and do a narrative study. Um, we just want to tell you some of the research activities. We decided to do it across the six Canadian PICUs that are all capable of do, using devices like ECMO and BADS. Um, and so they're a very high level intensive care units. Um, I'll, we'll read out the participants. Daniel went through how the team is. We had to narrow it down a bit. Basically, what we did was look at who tends to stand around the bedside of the child every morning kind of thing. So that's what we chose. And our research involved gathering stories through interviews with participants. Um, yeah, we, we um, advertised at the various uh, hospitals and that and put it out in through pediatric journals and so on asking for people to come forward with the stories of moral distress. And then what we did is we held two focus groups um, and we situated them just before pediatric or critical care conferences. Um, this was actually part of the research and 
people taking part in these groups sign consent forms. They we shared some stories with them and asked them if this resonated with their experience and and then they told us some of their own stories and they were very um, confirming that this was their experience as, as well. So that was part of our uh, included in part of our data. In fact, we found a bit there was almost an intervention with the focus groups in the sense that I remember one of the physicians in the group uh, when we shared a story of a dietitian at the end said, you know, wow, I, I never consider bringing the dietitian into my debriefings and she sort of was giving the impression that she would be changing that. Now she understood what, you know, the situation was like from the dietitian's perspective. Um, so we um, analyzed the uh, 63 stories we had pulled out and analyzed and we created a typology and I'll go briefly about a little, uh, further along about what a typology um, can mean. Um, and then uh, one of the ways we're trying, we've, we're taking dissemination very, very seriously. Um, we had a play written from it which has been performed here. Um, we just found out yesterday that our CIHR dissemination grant uh, got turned down, so we were asking for monies to have it um, uh, professionally filmed and created to a DVD so that we could circulate it amongst PICU staff and, and to others um, about this. So we'll, we'll go keep searching for some money. Um, people were saying it's a fantastic proposal, there's just not enough research money out there right now for, for all the projects that uh, need to be done. We have the website and that we're building on that as we go along as well. And then again, there's presentations like this and we're working on a book prospectus that will be able to share the, the stories as well. Um, and we have a secondary uh, analysis project going on led by Sarah Wall. Um, you may remember her as one of our former research assistants who's now a faculty member here in nursing. She has a doctorate in sociology and she's looking at the data to try to look at organizational influences on moral distress. And I just, this is just a flow chart of our activities. You can see it's a, a, a bit complicated in that we, you know, you take the stories, you go back to the participants and say, did we capture your story appropriately? And they say yes or no. And we ask them if we can go ahead with using the stories. And sometimes they say no. And um, yeah, we try to, um, we, we change um, situations and that we're very careful so that the anonymity of the participant and of the situation are, are are held and um, so that's uh, that gets to be complicated a bit but we gain we get their approval that we've done that and so we go back and forth with the uh, advisory group uh, we work on the typology and that continues to be refined and then um, uh, right now our major thing is trying to disseminate and trying to write up the project but a typology just briefly is it's, it's describing the stories of a certain kind together and we try to connect them. And so you can have certain diverse stories, but there's usually some, um, theme is probably the right word, but there's um, a type of story that well, we'll illustrate to you as we go along. Um, it tells something about the, the, the standpoint of the storyteller and it actually um, can point out fault lines between what individuals are experiencing and what institutions or the public can experience. And we've had participants say things like, um, you know, at a neighborhood party, having someone say to them, oh, you're so lucky you go to play with little children every day and look after little children. And she said, if, if, um, if, if they only knew what I did to children every day when I go to work. So there's a different image that the public might have than what the health professional feels they're living. And so it moves from these personally troubling moral distress stories to become actually more of a social issue. And we're going to go on to um, actually share with you some of the stories right now within the typology. So it is uh, important that um, we explain how, uh, and that's why we spend a few minutes explaining to you how we came up with this, because um, it's a little bit boring, but uh, <laughs> it's important for you to know. Uh, and we're going to share some stories. We cannot share 63 stories, um, but uh, we're giving an example uh, of one of each group of stories that um, that uh, we um, we have here, uh, just to show you how 
we classify them and give an example of one of them to show the impact of those stories uh, on people. So, for example, we, we use uh, the word resistance for some of these stories. They are stories told by team members which reveal resistance. The resistance can be from the patient, uh, although many times in children is from the family, uh, within the family, uh, also from the team or within the team caring for that uh, patient. The resistance can be to an ideology, to a care plan, which is mostly what the case is, or to the story itself, which is favored by the team. The team wants to see a story going one way, but there is uh, resistance for that uh, flow to go that way, or resistance from the institution, uh, or a family, uh, or uh, outside the immediate family. Uh, so these stories tend to be evenly uh, driven by the character and by the plot because they are about the conflict between actors in the story. So we're going to try to play a story for you. Uh, we had um, some sound issues before with this, so we'll try to do it this way. And uh, if it doesn't work, then Doug is going to play on the outside. But uh, we're going to try to play here for you one of these stories. I hear this statement from members of the team more and more often. We've given her all her chances. Yeah, it sounds good. What does that mean? I don't know what that means. In my opinion, if you're going to embark on treating somebody, I'm not sure how many chances you're supposed to give them. I don't think there's a limited number of chances. You come, rather, to a point where you decide that you're not going to treat them anymore, like this situation. Once we had a child in the unit with a complex syndrome, which meant issues with immunodeficiency, heart problems, and a whole host of other problems which called for multiple operations. We would get through one operation, then it was time for another, say it was surgery for her valve or a procedure to get her off the ventilator. I heard time after time after time, we've already given her her chance. I think a lot of that kind of malaise situates around whether we believe or the team believes or I believe that the degree of intensive care or invasiveness of what we're doing is going to result in a patient who's alive or alive with a certain quality of life at the end of things. The question we all ask is this, is it worth it, for lack of a better word, to continue invasive procedures? It's difficult because I'm confronted with opinions that are very different from mine. I'll hear she's had her chance now, she's not going to have a third surgery. There are other patients waiting. But what's the alternative to that? So we're going to tell the family that that's it, that we're not operating anymore? I'm coming out with the worst, obviously, but people say, yeah, just tell them there's nothing more we can do. Send them to the other hospital if they want anything more done. I have a lot of difficulty with that. With this girl, we continued to treat various aspects of her condition. We had some success. She was in PICU for many months, but then she went home. Yeah, she's still got some problems, and her development is delayed, but her parents love her, and her family loves her, and they're happy to have gotten her home. If we had decided this child should only get a certain number of chances, how would we decide what that number would be? Very good. Uh, so it is um, it is important to get into the context of this uh, story for more details, but due to the time constraints, uh, we just want to give you a snapshot of, of this situation where the healthcare professionals uh, this in case uh, told her this story that uh, uh, he was facing at that point in time. Another kind of story is a story of collusion uh, and is not collision as some <laughs> people have uh, confused with. Uh, collusion, uh, complicity. Uh, these are stories told by team members who feel that they have directly partaken in actions which uh, were contrary to their beliefs or values. Uh, they continue to be professionals, they continue to work as they are supposed to, uh, but within themselves uh, they had a problem with the outcome or with the development of their case. The stories are characterized in the telling by uh, a longer back uh, story, uh, so the teller's relationship to the situation will be understood, so there's a lot of background going on, and they are less linear than the other stories. Uh, but the teller is an actor in that story. He is part of the story, and he faces this this idea that he's being part of something that uh, he doesn't feel that is right. There is 
there's something that uh, does not resonate well within, uh, within him uh, or herself. So we're going to hear one story now that expresses that. So Doug can uh, play for us, please. We had a child in the unit for quite some time who'd get better and kind of rumble along for a bit. But then he'd have an attack and we'd have to get him through that. He'd start looking a little bit better, but he never really got well. He was never making progress. There's this mindset in PICU that they're children, so we can't let them die. But death is inevitable. We all die. Maybe it's best to let them die when they're first ready rather than make things go on and on. Eventually, we knew this child was going to die. The physician spoke to the family, and they were ready. They had been living with this long enough that they knew they didn't want to keep going in the hopes of just having him exist. They made him a do not resuscitate order, and we had very clear lines of what we could and couldn't do. We thought that he'd, he'd probably keep going for a few days, so we sent the parents home to spend some time with their other children. Unexpectedly, the child reached the point where he was ready to die in only a matter of hours. There was a new nurse in there with him, and she was in over her head. She said, I think I should do something. I asked, well, what can you do? We have a do not resuscitate order. She didn't have an answer. Okay, I told her, I think we need to get the doctor to tell us what he would like us to do. And we got the green light to administer more epinephrine. I have issues with people saying he's a do not resuscitate, but we'll push the epi up to 0.2. That's more than a code dose of epi, but we'll do it because we can. We've got it, and we might as well use it. But with profound hypertensive episodes, there, there's a dramatic increase in blood pressure that hurts. It hurts. How do I know it hurts? I know what it feels like when a limb is falling asleep and I reestablish circulation. It hurts. And I'm sure that it's a painful thing to go from a systolic blood pressure of 30 to one of 100 in 30 seconds. There are things that we do that hurt, but that are necessary. I don't have a problem with those things if the end result is going to be a good one. If we will get this child back to some semblance of what life was like before. But if we're just doing it because we're not ready to sign the death certificate, that's wrong. In this situation, though, I didn't have a problem doing what it took to keep his heart beating until his family arrived. His parents came as fast as they could. The baby was still pink, still warm, and so they believed that he died in their arms. No one will ever take that away from them. They didn't need to know that their baby's heart stopped minutes before they arrived. We knew not to tell them. So this story uh, of a nurse at the bedside uh, explaining that uh, the child had a DNR, do not resuscitate order, the old term that we used to use. Nowadays, we, we have uh, been more specific about that. But um, what happened is that the nurse uh, uh, noticed that the child deteriorated rather quickly when the parents would, were uh, uh, let go home because everybody felt that... Uh, this child was going to be, as she was for a few days, uh, very stable, uh, waiting for some catastrophic event to happen. Uh, and it did happen. And then everybody wants the parents back because that was the plan to have a, a better uh, way of dying uh, with the parents around. And uh, they quickly decide to call the parents back. But here it is, the child is dying, heart rate is down, pressure is down. And they decide then, let's give some medicine, let's give some epinephrine to get this heart pumping again, get this blood pressure up again from almost 20, 30, uh, up to 100, to allow the parents to see the child is still alive. The plan was to not to give anything, but this uh, group at that moment in time made this rational decision and decided to do that. So this nurse had significant trouble with this because first, the order was not followed, and second, 
uh, they may this child perhaps have some kind of a feeling of this r rapid raise in blood pressure uh, and uh, she didn't feel comfortable with that. But at the end, as you can hear, you could hear, is that she settled with this in her heart that was for the family, not more for the child. So you can argue that was a good ending because the child and the family got the notion that they were able to have the child on their arms as the child was dying. Although everybody in the room knew that this may have happened a few minutes before. But uh, the overall arching mode on that room was to make this family have a moment that will be cherished for the rest of their life, lives by having this child dying peacefully in their arms. That doesn't take away the fact that for this nurse, that will be in her memory for the rest of her life. Um, this is a collusion story that you might see as a, as a colluding on something that had a, a good outcome, but some of the collusion stories are are that they've colluded in something that's wrong. The story still raises issues with people who they say uh, was that an ethical thing to do to pretend the child was still alive. And then, and then this nurse says, in a sense, uh, yes, it was. Good. So the next um, set of uh, stories that we uh, put a typology name as stories uh, bearing witness, those are stories told by team members who are not directly involved in a situation. They are not actors, but uh, they witness this is happening in the unit. And the nature of the pediatric ICUs, they are relatively uh, small places and people know what's going on. And uh, they, uh, they are troubled what, by what's going on and, and hence they feel compelled to tell the story what they have witnessed. These stories tend to focus on a narrow portion of the story sometimes, just a portion that is witnessed or the whole story. Uh, and uh, sometimes it's focusing on actions of uh, an individual or a group of individuals. Sometimes it's called the surgeons. Sometimes it's the intensivists as a whole. Or sometimes it's the nurses did this or did that or did not do that. The plot may be resolved. Uh, the patient dies or is discharged sometimes from the hospital. The conflict may be diffused. Uh, but um, issues raised in the story are not resolved. So those are stories that um, I still resonate and uh, are in the memory of some people. So we're, we're going to uh, tell you a story as it being told by a social worker of a child that uh, she experienced. A child with Down syndrome and a heart defect was admitted in respiratory distress. Early on, it was identified that this child required heart surgery, very high risk surgery because his lungs were so compromised. The family, because of their religious beliefs, said that they could not, would not consent for the surgery. They knew that this meant that their child would likely die. The family presented very well. They spoke about a ventilator not being a natural way for this child to live by saying that God's taking the breath away from their child was God's way of calling him back home. So they wanted him to essentially go back home. They articulated their beliefs and values very well and were very respectful of the team, very appreciative that the team was doing what they thought was best for their child. They made it very clear what their wishes were, and they had a lot of support from their community. This whole thing was very challenging for the team in terms of process. After all, the job of the PICU team is to make the most of whatever chance there might be to keep a child alive. The physicians and nurses would talk with me privately, informally, how they were feeling about the situation we found ourselves in. Listening is a big part of my job as a social worker in the team. I don't get to express how I'm feeling as much as I would like. I save that for home or for when I'm with other social workers. As time progressed, the child's condition really deteriorated. Then it became challenging to negotiate between, legally, this is what we need to do. We need to go the child welfare route, but you know, the parents have a good point. Some team members, including me, were starting to see the family's point of view. 
and the child was deteriorating. A decision had to be made about the surgery, so child welfare was contacted. The parents remained very understanding, saying, We understand what you need to do. There was a court hearing, and my role was to advocate for the family, even if I didn't share their values and beliefs. I have to say that the judge was very supportive in her decision, acknowledging the parents' position, but saying, in the end, I'm supporting the doctors. There's a slight possibility that your child's condition may improve with surgery, so I'll need to order in accordance with that. There was no indication at all that these parents were angry or frustrated at the process. It was, we understand that as a medical profession, you are doing what you need to do. Though the child was in the care of child welfare so that they could make the medical decisions, the parents were very involved through all of it. They continued to be very collaborative, respectful. Here I was working with a family that has a very different value base from mine, advocating for them and helping them articulate their wishes. We had a meeting, all the physicians were there, and me as a social worker. The parents were not there. Many of the physicians were starting to say, you know what, I think we've done enough. Any further investigation would be to no avail. But some were saying, you know, maybe we could do this test and this test, just to make sure. I had conflicting emotions in regard to advocating or empowering parents whose beliefs and values were different than mine, but I felt it was important to be an advocate for the family in this situation and to say, well, you know, what I'm hearing is that his chances of survival are very, very low, which the doctors agreed with. If some tests are needed, can we try and act as soon as possible? so that we can give this child a dignified death and one where the parents can be involved. He can be extubated in mom's arms and they can have whatever ritual they want to have so that it's a dignified death for them versus keeping the child on a ventilator for several more days and then he dies when his parents aren't there. We need a closure not only for the parents but for the team. So we came to the place where we could say to the parents, We've reached the end and asked how they would like their child's last moments to be. And so the child died two days after his surgery. It was very sad and distressing that he and his parents had to go through it all. In the end, though, the parents knew what was best for their son. All along, they did not show any signs of aggression. They remained cooperative, and that really helped us, the team, to cope. So, as you heard, uh, this is a child that um, the parents did not agree to go to surgery. And a Down syndrome with a uh, congenital malformation of the heart, uh, it's natural to have surgery. Uh, it's very rare to face this condition um, where a family would say no. Uh, but in this case, the child was a weak, very small. Uh, the lungs were sick. So the family felt that was not the right thing to do based on their religious beliefs. The team continued to uh, stress that this is the right thing to do, is the best interest of the child to have the surgery done. And that's when the conflict uh, um, appeared. And as you heard, the family was very good. They um, were interact very well with the group, but that didn't take the stress away. And it's just not on the basis of just an ethical dilemma. This is the distress that came to this uh, social worker that she had to face her own views on this. She had to face the views of the team. She had to face the views of the family. At the end result, the child, after being apprehended, got the surgery, but ended up dying two days later. So the parents uh, could have said, see, I told you so. But no, they actually finished the case with the group in a good in a good tone. The problem is that this social worker still has this story haunting her uh, and she does have some kind of resolution knowing that the family was grateful. So not all not all the time these stories ended up being uh, sour at the end. They can 
finish well, but it doesn't take away the fact that during that time, this person experienced significant, significant uh, moral distress. Sometimes I think the uh, roles like social workers who are, are very strong in the bearing witness because they, they don't feel they're enacting um, or affecting the medical decision, but that their role is to be advocates for the family and to help explain what the team's thinking is and that kind of thing. So in a sense, I, I felt strongly from this story that she uh, was bearing witness to what was happening. And as she tells the story, she's sort of trying to be fair to, to all sides and that kind of thing. Yeah. So we also have some stories that we call the phantom stories, or um, those are stories that uh, about situations whose um, whose narrative has become part of the folklore of the lore of that particular ICU. Every ICU has some of those stories. And if you ask different people, they all tell the same story. These stories uh, may influence the decisions uh, made for subsequent patients mm -hmm. based on what happened with that, that one, that particular one that everybody remembers. And uh, in, in this also brings back uh, moral distress many times when people start thinking when the new case comes, based on the old story that was there before. And um, by providing examples, uh, we uh, hope that, uh, justify or not, the distress can be resolved or was not resolved or will be resolved. So those stories we, uh, we also um, heard in our study. Uh, sometimes also there is that uh, typical story that says, don't say her name. Every time someone says her name, she comes back in. Don't, don't even say her name. We talk about her in our coffee breaks. It's still a bit superstitious about saying her name because she's going to show up again. And uh, you can say, wow, that's bad to talk about a child like that, uh, being a, a healthcare professional. But this is, this is part of the folklore of a particular unit. And many of these children are lovely and the parents are very, very lovely. But the condition is such that it brings distress many times when the child comes in with uh, a condition that has not been resolved, families that insist on a kind of treatment that the team doesn't feel that is appropriate, but because of the parent's autonomy and uh, the status quo of the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the unit, the child keeps getting treatment again and again and again. So those are stories that we call the phantom stories. And then there are the untold stories. And that's very interesting uh, because uh, people told us stories and they afterwards uh, would tell us, please don't share this with anyone. Uh, we cannot share these stories publicly. You cannot use my story uh, in your project after the fact, after they told us. And, and we accept those stories. Uh, we heard them uh, and uh, we kept them even though we told them that we would change every name, every circumstances, sometimes the disease to allow uh, no identification be possible, uh, they still said, no, I prefer not to, but I still want to tell you. These include stories of participants also that um, they um, could not uh, approve the stories for retelling. Uh, after we gave them the uh, synopsis of the story uh, on paper, they read it, and they said, no, no, I prefer not to share. And the other uh, group of stories is that they actually, uh, uh, when we send them back the stories, they never answer back. And there are just a couple of situations where we showed them the result of the, the story being typed and, uh, and changed, but they never got back to us. So we called the untold stories. And I think there's also the people who didn't come forward to, to tell us some of the stories because um, in my other types of moral distress research, I'm also finding that people can feel it's very dangerous to tell some of these stories. So they're, they're quite hesitant about it because um, part of the power of stories is that stories can make trouble and um, stories can get out of control. And I think sometimes you are very afraid of giving voice to your particular story. So uh, it is important also to realize that um, in moral distress, in our research, uh, we uh, look at the literature and we found that um, moral distress is not a nursing phenomenon any longer. It started in nursing, but it now has been described 
in uh, many countries around the world uh, has been described being experienced by pediatric residents, surgery residents, uh, so residents from other areas, uh, has been experienced by pharmacists, has been experienced and published by um, uh, psychologists, psychiatry nurses, psychiatry docs, residents, and also, uh, interesting enough, by uh, hospital administrators. Uh, they have also uh, uh, gathered uh, their um, moral distress and uh, publish uh, in the literature. So it's universal, universal in the healthcare system right now. So we're not talking about something particular to nursing staff only. And you heard dietitian, you heard a social worker, uh, and this uh, in this small presentation that we gave you. Yeah, we thought we'd just uh, go over some of the triggers of moral distress in PICU that have been recognized. With, by participants in our study when we looked at their stories, but also this is some of the other research in the area when you take a look. A, a major one is that of communication breakdown. Um, as Daniel mentioned earlier, miscommunication is a big factor, but also trying to get information. Um, these are fast-paced, high-intensity units where people are working in, in shifts often and taking over, and sometimes decisions are made and people don't understand why they're missing a piece of the information. Um, Clinical ethicists will tell you often when ethics committees meet over an issue, part of it has been that not everybody has been informed what's going on or they're not speaking to each other. And unfortunately, that does happen in PICUs. We find that um, they would tell us about, you know, refusing to speak to other staff members uh, about a particular incident because they're so angry. Uh, hierarchy and power differences are, um, are certainly a big part of it. People will say their, their voice isn't heard. Um, Dietitians have actually spoken about that, that their voice wasn't heard, that people just have changed what their order without um, a physician, for example, changing what the dietitian put in place without consulting or talking to them about the reason. But the dietitian that told this particular story also said that she understood that um, her contribution may not be as, as strong as a person who, you know, engine is inserting a vat. But that, um, and so you could see she was sort of ambivalent about how much to push her uh, to speak out and to speak loudly. Um, the power differences are disciplinary ones as well as administrative ones, and um, these occur in in many, of course, healthcare areas um, in many workplaces. Period, um, and it's how these are dealt with. Um, one of the issues I'm thinking is a, is a big one is that being afraid of raising the ethical questions, saying I'm worried about us doing this, I'm wondering if we should be doing this, um, because there can be consequences. You can get actually even austerized or you can be pulled into the manager's office and told not to be raising, you know, not to be uh, a troublemaker basically. Um, the disciplinary conflicts are often from different perspectives and different kinds of responsibilities. Um, and these can, can occur among the physicians in their different roles as well as amongst the members of the team, respiratory therapists and, and nurses and, and so on. So, um, um, and then there's the chaplain who's trying to, similar to the social workers, trying to get the different viewpoints heard, the families and the child represented and so on. And so these are a type of disciplinary conflict as well. Um, the, the issues with the families are often related to um, diverse views on disability, for example, or goals of therapy, or um, the idea of patient suffering. And sometimes the families are so hoping for a miracle. Um, shows like, um, you know, Dr. House and others who has, uh, we come to expect miracles that we just stay on longer. And when people read about troubles in our healthcare system, they often feel as the um, family member, they have to protect and demand things for their family member or it's not going to happen because they didn't do a strong enough job in this area. So um, these are the kinds of things that can happen. The diverse views on disability, th that was for me almost part of an untold story is the good disability story um, because PICU teams worry about causing disabilities in their treatment um, and that the child will have to exist with this disability for the rest of their life. We're told stories like um, one where the was going to require amputation of two of the limbs of the child and the staff were horrified um, at this little girl going through life without her arms, but the next door 
to the family lived a woman who was born without arms and they, they saw what a rich life that she had. Um, and so the family was actually able to help the staff get past the um, concern about um, their child living with a disability. So um, one of the big issues, of course, is how to resolve some of these issues so that we're not getting a lot of residue for each person as they build. And, and, um, and they end up actually, um, a lot of the research in moral distress is qualitative in nature, but over many studies it's seen that this is a reason for people to um, quit the job. Um, and of course, to get well-trained PICU staff is expensive and difficult. Um, and so it's a huge loss when this happens, but the turnover in PICUs is quite high compared to some other areas. Um, and as well, some people actually stop practicing, period, and uh, if something has been devastating to them enough. Um, so one of the various things is, again, are things that we asked at the end of the interviews on the stories about types of things that they had experienced that would help resolve things or things they wished had happened. And this is also coming from other research. So debriefing is a very obvious one um, and that we, we all learn about and learn how to do. Um, often though it's in very informal, especially when you're not supposed to be raising some of the questions. These are the back room discussions, um, the parking lot discussions, or you go home and you you try to tell your spouse, but of course, if your spouse is a healthcare professional, it can be very devastating for them to even to try to hear this. And um, after all, um, people get very worried about that. Um, colleagues, of course, are a very important part. Some of the social workers will say, I, I, I have a good relationship with the team, but I, I need to meet with my social worker colleague at least once a month just for us to be able to discuss this. Because of course, confidentiality is a very big issue here, and I know health professionals are constantly aware of that. So it's how to debrief and help reflect so they can make sense of it. And in a way, they're telling their stories informally in this debriefing. And then the formal debriefing, which gets more and more difficult to do because often some of the people most involved will be, their shift will be over after the episodes occurred and they're at home sleeping while it's getting debriefed formally. And so again, this is um, a big challenge for administration to help try to organize. Some of the other suggestions were having rounds where you learn from the various situations, you're actually articulating them and it may be an opportunity for people to share their viewpoints, even to be able to say, I wish we had gone this direction instead, that kind of thing. Uh, um, so trying to do that might be helpful. I think actual multidisciplinary team building um, needs to happen where um, that you help each other to see each other's perspectives and so on. That needs to be done in many parts of healthcare, if not all parts of healthcare. Um, actually, one of the intensivists who um, I interviewed um, sort of said that morning she had heard um, driving into the hospital on the radio a story about a um, aeronautic team and how they, uh, similar to the snowbirds, that that how they practiced every day and really trained together. And she really wished that that could happen for her with her team. But because there's so many people involved, she often doesn't even particularly know well one of the essential members of her team. The, the turnover is quite great, of course, with each shift and, and each day. So that, that's, again, another challenge. The inclusive decision making means, uh, of course, the family as well as members of the team the example before the physician not thinking about including the dietitian in the in the discussion is a, is an example and sometimes it's um, it, it's oversight there's nothing deliberate about it it's actually not having a broad enough perspective to understanding everyone's role and again the fast pace and the quickness about making the decision and the heavy responsibility that's involved as part of that um, and you know as Daniel says sometimes in the end. Um, the physician still has to be the one that's to sign off on this. So, um, you know, we we are legally making physicians responsible, but at the same time, we're acting. We want it to be more that the, the team making decision, team decisions, um, ethical consultations where uh, clinical ethicists can come and speak. Most of the PIC units um, that we worked with are open to doing that. I think, and um, and also um, some of the residents have been. Um, 
very straightforward about the ethics training. Some of them who had ethics training are very concerned that their colleagues don't have any of the language to even speak of ethics. They're not quite sure, or they don't identify the problem as an ethical one. It stays a clinical one. So trying to resolve it in that way can get, get complicated for them. And has been, uh, we have uh, now data in the literature that uh, if you um, create uh, an environment where ethics is uh, part of the daily routine and uh, ethics uh, training and discussion happens often, uh, there has been uh, now evidence that decreases the level of moral distress. So it is important that this is not just one person that or two that raised that as a solution for us or a way of resolving this, but uh, it, is, uh, it is now shown by evidence that actually works. And the other thing that uh, I, in my experience, and uh, could be anecdotal, but it is true that uh, many times the nurses have major issues about a case. And then when you sit down and do a, a round on that case and they lounge all together and everybody hears the rationale why the physician mm -hmm. came up with that decision with the family, people say, oh, now you lifted a big weight of my shoulders. Now I understand why this is happening. Now I feel much better. Not because she or he agreed with that, but she understands the rationale. So part of it is communication. Part of it is empowerment to be part of the group that actually discuss, not necessarily going with the family at, in the room to discuss the, the uh, decision-making process participation, but to be aware that I feel this way that is my view for the team to be aware it's already a way to uh, improve. Um, and one of the other points maybe we should make here is that um, there is research um, about intensive care teams showing that, um, of course, um, good team functioning uh, at a high level actually decreases uh, patient mortality and morbidity rates. So it's very, very important that team functions well. But they wanted to also um, emphasize that it wasn't teams that have no conflict. It was actually teams having conflict, but resolving that conflict in, in good ways. So, so I think that's sort of a misconception people have, is that, um, is that they're trying to aim for no conflict at all. Um, so there are just a couple of other resolution things we wanted to mention, um, and, and that are more individual ones. Um, so people suggest that you get time away from the unit or for the situation that you, you do get your breaks. Uh, and this is getting more and more complicated, it seems, for administrators to be able to ensure happenings. People aren't getting holidays. If you're short staffed, people are giving up their holidays to stay and this kind of thing. So it's actually uh, a difficult area. And then self-care, um, the idea of staying fit, um, um, doing things like journaling, um, trying to sustain a, a sense of humor in the unit, and often it, I know from Mary's eye practice, it's a type of black humor where you know if anybody else overheard you, they'd wonder what kind of people you are. But um, but it actually does it does help. And um, also the spiritual strategy. Some of the participants spoke about, uh, for example, a nurse told us after the death of a child, she would go home and she would have some flowers and light a candle and think about that child and sort of try to give herself some closure on that. And I know other places may do that as a unit rather than as individuals. I think an important point here to make, though, is that moral distress, persons with moral distress shouldn't be seen as weak people. I think there are people with high levels of ethical sensitivity. And so I worry when uh, institutions only focus on individual strategies because as we've tried to present here, it's very much a systems or a team kind of um, issue that we have to address. So yeah, the, uh, we feel strongly that the total elimination of moral distress in healthcare should, should not be a goal. And uh, I think uh, we want to uh, do a poll, but I think the time is running out. Okay. So I think we want to see what people would say if, if moral distress should be eliminated. But I think uh, having moral distress, is, it's, uh, it's a sign that professions are sensitive to the moral domain of their practice. Uh, so advice such as suck it up or leave, or if you cannot stand the heat in the kitchen, then get out, is clearly insensitive, insensitive to the complexities of ethical practice. So I think uh, when, when, um, when moral distress comes, it could be a good sign that you have people that have 
uh, have good morals, good ethic background, and they feel uncomfortable what was going on, and they need to discuss. So it's an alarm signal that uh, the context sometimes is problematic, and uh, but it's not always a bad sign. And I think that's what we need to look at is develop develop uh, some process and support that foster open, authentic uh, discussion of ethical concerns from each person's perspective, including healthcare professionals, parents, and, and patients when even patients are able to, to talk. So it is being uh, proposed that uh, we need kind of a reciprocal understanding as Frank Carnevale has uh, used a French word that I cannot pronounce properly, but it's rapprochement or something like that. Um, it's, uh, yeah, re reciprocal <laughs> understanding amongst the people that are involved. And uh, that may involve struggles for respect, trust, uh, power, and, uh, but the goal would be uh, seeking a common ground. And it is important, as Wendy alluded to, uh, real-time sharing of information. Don't delay that for two, three, four weeks before you start uh, raising the issue because then everybody already made their minds and it's very difficult to reverse the situation. So venting sessions, uh, used to be called debriefing sessions, <laughs> are uh, very good. Not necessarily with that Mitchell model that has been nowadays in the literature contested, but just allowing people to vent and to be speaking out about their, their views and their feelings. So it is important for administrators to realize that, as Wendy said, this is a major reason for people leaving the ICUs, not only pediatric, but adult as well. So uh, it is important factor for the labor force. So in terms of administration, uh, I think we need uh, to uh, allow the environment to be uh, open to this uh, discussion, uh, giving uh, the opportunity for people to speak uh, bringing people from outside to build up the teams if need, need to be, do venting sessions, and then allow people to deliver the care to the patients that they can to the full potential. And I think that's what uh, we want at the end of the day. All right, so we'd just like to thank you for, for being with us this morning, and we look forward to any comments or questions that you might have to share with us. All right, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Garros and, uh, and Dr. Austin. That was a fantastic presentation. I think very powerful. The use of stories is always incredible. I think it was, it was uh, uh, Dr. Ev uh, Mike Evans, who was at our conference a couple years ago, who said uh, stories trump data. And I think uh, these examples certainly uh, provided a, a, some powerful support to uh, the message that you were giving on moral distress in the PICU. Uh, so, uh, you know, again, as a reminder, as uh, Dr. Austin said, uh, if there's any questions or comments, please uh, feel free to type them in. Uh, but I think uh, Elaine uh, Orbein in, in the office here has a question for you. Thanks, Doug. And, and I, too, um, to Daniel and, and Wendy, thank you so much. Uh, just, just as Doug said, a very powerful presentation and, and such an important topic to bring to the CAFC community. So our thanks to you for, for this opportunity. Um, something toward the end of the presentation, Daniel, that you mentioned around um, ethics training, and 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 I'm just wondering if you can speak to the um, formal um, training as part of the residency curriculum or um, medical school curriculum, for for that matter, sort of um, just that exists. Does or does not exist, and sort of your thoughts on um, on where that should be. I, I I get a strong sense that it's not where it should be, and and perhaps something that needs to be addressed. So I just just I know that's sort of an open ended question, but I'd really appreciate your thoughts. Yes, I uh, I appreciate your question, Elaine, and I think it's a very important topic. Uh, I think in medical school we have a very cold and very distant uh, ethics um, training, and uh, and and we go back always to the principalism of the, the you know the four principles and and maybe a few others thrown in there. And I tell you a story that I think illustrates this very well. Um, when uh, when we had a case of a kid that had a brain tumor that was inoperable and uh, uh, radiation, there was not nothing else to be done that could uh, 
help that child except for comfort measures. The family insisted on in putting the kid on the ventilator and continuing everything. And uh, we did a poll at the end uh, with the nurses after we struggled and let the child die. Uh, and, and many nurses and doctors came up to us and said, residents said, can you actually withdraw uh, life-sustaining treatment in somebody that is still has a normal functioning brain despite of that tumor? So that tells you that uh, there was a lack of uh, understanding that uh, how you can withdraw and what does it mean. Another typical situation is, is the multidisciplinary. One thing is to have the doctors trained, the residents trained, but what about the respiratory therapist? One of them told us that I never received any training in my respiratory therapist uh, course about ethics, and now you go and ask me to go into the room and pull this ET tube while the mom is holding this baby uh, and uh, on her arms and allowing the baby to die. And that uh, uh, shocked me when I heard the first time. And in many occasions, some of my colleagues will make the decision, will write the order, and the respiratory therapist will be the one that physically would do the withdrawal by pulling the ET tube. So no ethics training, no background on that. And that person now has to live with that, uh, that action. So I think it's important that the ethics training, in my view, is context-based. So you are now part of your job. Uh, as part of your um, training in a new job, working in the ICU, part of your sessions with the, in nursing and residency and, uh, and uh, staff is to have ethics training refreshment if you had before, but more applied to the context where you are. And Wendy is a professor of ethics, so she can tell a little bit more about that. Well, I think one of the strong points Daniel's just made is, is ethics education is not only just how to uh, make uh, moral decisions and to be able to use principles and other ideas, but I think a lot of the education, um, and, and because um, we are dealing in um, with levels of very high biotechnology and that um, and critical thinking evidence-based practice are the emphasis, including in nursing, we're more and more getting away from preparing health professionals how to be as health professionals and including how to be up close to the pain and suffering and death. Um, and our, our, our society doesn't um, like to talk about death too much, and, and certainly in Western culture. And that's so, so they come in often into their um, health professional education with not a very good place of being so that they understand about and have thought about and talked about the human condition and the fact that everyone's mortal. And um, and I think we let them down when we don't prepare them for what they're going to encounter. As Arthur Frank puts it, if we don't let them know the stories they're going to grow into. Um, this weekend, I gave a paper at a, at a nursing education conference, um, and I was asking that we um, spend more attention on talking about how to be a compassionate and how to sustain compassion. Because even in nursing, the idea of emotion is becoming um, um, seen as it can be a weakness. It takes us away somehow from making good decisions. And of course, neuroscience is telling us that's not right, that you, your limbic system isn't functioning, you can't make good decisions. So I think you know it's a very excellent question, Elaine. And so it's two parts. No, I don't think often that, that there is enough ethics education. and. Also, it's the kind and the lack of breadth in that education that's, I think, an issue. But to be practical, I think it can be started at the level of entrance in the ICU when you come in mm -hmm. to work in there. Part of your learning how to manage a central line mm -hmm. and manage how to uh, put a, uh, a kid to, on the ventilator, and you should be also learning how to uh, deal with the conflicts and how to prepare yourself for death, dying, and how do you react to that? And what are the principles that allow you to withdraw? What are the principles behind brain death, for example, and that kind of thing? So very practical teaching needs to be so, happening. Daniel and, and Wendy, thank you for that for that response and thoughtfulness. I, I think just one quick suggestion, perhaps, this story, your presentation, um, and as, as Doug said, stories do trump data um, often. I, I think that um, you should be thinking about taking this story to 
the residency, um, uh, the program uh, leads and um, across the country. They have a, a national group, if you will, that meets regularly. And, and I think they would be an ideal target, sort of collective audience to hear and, and for you to share this with. And, and I'm sure you can think of many others as well, but there's an opportunity here yeah. for you to expand your leadership, which I think would be very, very uh, powerful. Yes, yeah, so we are going to present also in the Canadian Pediatric Society Wonderful. in June and here in Edmonton. Uh, the, uh, this, uh, there will be a seminar where we are actually going to get the actors to perform some of the stories, our play, and then they will have an open discussion, number one. Number two, that's why we want to do the DVD, we just need money for it, uh, to actually record these uh, stories uh, by the play, uh, like as they play on the, on the, uh, on the theater. Uh, and, uh, will record and then our aim is to distribute to medical school residency programs and the ICU so yes it's a good point. That's excellent Daniel I'm really glad to hear that and we'll we'll keep it in mind for expansion through CAFC's network as well. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the group? Uh, no, I don't see uh, any other questions uh, coming in. We'll give people just uh, one or two second, more seconds if they've uh, got their fingers flying on the keyboard there to, to get a quick comment in before we close this off. Um, and just while we're waiting for any other uh, questions, I'll just uh, uh, remind everyone that this session was recorded. Uh, and it will be posted on the Knowledge Exchange Network on the page that you see here. It'll be uh, posted where the registration link is. We'll just replace that with the video when it's available. Uh, and as always, uh, CAFC Presents, we do this uh, Wednesdays at uh, 11 Eastern Time. Uh, and you can always go to CAFC.org, our website, if you want to be updated on upcoming uh, webinars, uh, either via the uh, email list or the calendar that's on the website there. So uh, we don't have any other questions. We had a couple people uh, comment in uh, that they said thanks, and it was a great presentation, but they don't have any questions. So I guess uh, with that being said, unless you have any final comments, uh, Dr. Austin or Dr. Garrels, before we close off? I would just... I was just going to yeah I was just going to say that um, people can uh, if they have any further comments or e uh, our email and our website is there so people can uh, email back uh, and uh, we'll be happy to share uh, our uh, thoughts and uh, happy to answer questions and even happen to hear more stories that I'm sure every time we present this people come to us at the end they'll say oh this I have a story exactly like that or something like that so it's also sometimes even a therapy for people to tell the stories to us. So, yeah, thank you for the opportunity. We are very glad that uh, we're able to participate uh, in the CAFC conference uh, webinar. All right, well, Russ, thank This you. is a very important audience, so thanks so much. Oh, you're absolutely welcome, and, th and thanks to you for... Uh, uh, we did have a question that just came in here, uh, and I sort of had the same question. Uh, uh, do, do you utilize child life specialists at your hospital, or have you seen them come up in your research at all as, as playing a significant role in this? Yes, uh, in fact, very good. Uh, we do have it in our unit here, and I know many other ICUs that have child life specialists. They are very, very important part, uh, and they um, uh, allow to the children to be prepared for dying many times. They allow the families to be prepared for the dying uh, sibling or a son or daughter, and also uh, child life is being able to, uh, in many places like ours, join the bereavement committee. Uh, allowing uh, to uh, give their uh, thoughts uh, in terms of uh, how to better uh, go through the transition from uh, living to uh, dying or the phase of from treatment to comfort measures. So yes, uh, answer the question, very important group, very, and I would encourage very seriously administrators never, never to cut the funding for child life because nurses are too busy to play uh, with the children, although they do the, uh, the best that they can. And children are children still in the ICU, still when they are dying. And, uh, and through play, they can actually face a better, a better death. So I'm a strong believer, and uh, I see a very important role in child life. Well, I think uh, that's exactly the right answer. Uh, you may not know, but we do have a fairly significant uh, segment of our audiences from the child life uh, segment, so I'm sure they are very pleased to hear your support of, uh, of their role, and I can, certainly couldn't agree more. 
Um, that uh, that was the only that's the last of the questions that we have here. So again, thanks thanks for your great presentation. I think it was very powerful, and I th I'm sure we'll uh, get lots more opportunity for people to view it uh, online following this. So uh, again, uh, we hope to see everyone else on the upcoming uh, sessions of our webinars uh, next Wednesday, and uh, hopefully we'll see you then. Thanks again, and bye.